So yeah, my background is in physics, and I have the unique opportunity to combine two technologies um, that I have worked on um, in the 80s. So one was my thesis, and it was about uh, uh, chaos theory, <coughs> and there, there is one name of a big mathematician, which is Kolmogorov, and I applied his theorems and then on my way to the US, um, teaching at Northwestern University, um, I had about a year as a postdoctoral fellow at Technical University in Munich, where I did program an associative memory on um, a Motorola 68000. <coughs> so it was my first program in a 32-bit, uh, on a 32-bit machine, and I learned C and the assembler, and it was also a Unix operating system. And then many, many years passed, and I had a couple of different jobs at BSF, for instance, the biggest chemical company in the world, and then at SAP. And I came back with my wife to the US. <laughs> and now I have this chance uh, to combine them. And that's what my talk will be all about. Um, by now, you have heard a lot about the uh, promises and limits of cognitive computing. IBM is uh, pushing the message of cognitive computing very loudly out in all the channels. And this talk uh, is about uh, showing you how we have overcome some of the limitations to realize more of the promise of cognitive computing. I am going to show you this by means of uh, showing how we have combined two core ideas that have been around for a while that allow machines to act like super brains. And those two core ideas are associative memories and cognitive distance based on Kolmogorov uh, complexity. And by associative memories, we mean a representation that enables the association of huge amounts of data and of finding pattern in real time. And it's at Safran Technologies, we have made associative memory scale to big data. And we use cognitive distance to uh, make sense out of the data and to reason like human beings do, but in a much uh, faster and more powerful way. And combining those two ideas of the representation of the fabric of the associative memory and then using cognitive distance for machine learning on top of it, uh, this is a match made in heaven. And this match made in heaven enables us to overcome some of the limitations of traditional machine learning, like the scalability at the one hand and uh, the ability to be able to add knowledge on the fly incrementally in a, cons in a consistent way. I will show you three examples where we have applied uh, cognitive computing. And in those three examples, we have helped uh, human beings to take decisions based on data that had already existed but had not been known, had not been used before we applied associative memories. And the first example is related uh, to, predict to predictive maintenance. We all have been in this situation where we have been at the airport and we wanted to board a plane, but we are told we are delayed because a part is broken. There is a mechanical problem. And this is a typical problem that Boeing faces and all airlines have to reduce their aircraft downtime. So our challenge is to predict <coughs> before the part breaks. And we had the chance to do this together with Boeing, or they used our tool. And what we do there is we take the structured data from the Boeing databases, from the maintenance, repair, and operations from the ERP system, and have key performance indicator that they have developed over many years. And we combine this with the knowledge, with what the pilot says in this context, and with the notes of the mechanic. And thus we generate and we are able to store and then reason on top of this knowledge that has been generated collectively. 
And so we are able to uh, do this uh, prediction. And before uh, Boeing uh, applied an associative memory, they used uh, a modeling, traditional statistical modeling, that has been developed by the NASA. <coughs> and the accuracy they had, or actually the recall, was 66% and they had 16% false alarms. And after applying the associative memory, the recall was pushed to 100% by reducing the false alarms uh, to 1%. So only one out of 100 parts has been marked uh, to be replaced and it would not have been replaced. But we had a recall of 100%, that means we did not miss any part. Naturally, if you bring this in a, in, a, in, in, a, in a bigger environment where we will do predictive maintenance in the US and then hopefully don't have to wait at the airport after it will have been approved by the FAA, the numbers will be not that uh, optimistic. It will be a little bit less than 100% recall. The second problem is about predicting an unknown threat. We all know that when the bomb explodes, the bad guy has been there. But how to find the bad guy uh, before he puts the bomb or before he even builds it? And we had the chance to <coughs> implement an early warning system at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to predict <coughs> unknown threats. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, has a lot of friends, but it also has enemies. And so, they have developed an early warning system to look at, at small signals, for instance, from all the incoming correspondence, from emails, people calling in, sending mails, or talking to the foundation, and to be able to predict from these um, unknown threats. They analyze web pages of activist groups, for instance, groups, uh, white supremacists who are against the Gates Foundation giving money in Africa, or people who are against GMO, and as we know, they work very closely with uh, uh, Monsanto to develop, for instance, uh, drought-resistant crop, and those people are against them. And then it is individual people who want to meet uh, Bill Gates or his wife, but better should it. So we take all this data, and then um, we have this early warning system where we can see from very small signals. It's not big signals, so I see that it grows bigger and bigger. It's a combination of very weak signals. It goes back to Igor Ansov, who has developed the theory, and he was a physicist who analyzed uh, <coughs> before brick, uh, bridges break. So he was a guy who predicted uh, for before that when bridges would break. And his name is Igor Ansov, as you can see there on the slide. So what we do is we analyze, for instance, in real time an incoming email, and we read between the lines if the person that has sent the email or the organization the person belongs to poses a threat to the foundation. And then uh, if we have identified uh, this person as being a threat, as being a high threat, it goes to the intelligence uh, team. And then they take the further action. And the third example I'm talking to you about, and I will show you also a video about mm -hmm. that, is um, an example from healthcare, where we have huge amount of data and it is not possible for a human being to make sense of this data. You know, the doctors, they have their <laughs> science, their medicine, then they have their intuition, and then they have all this data from uh, medical devices. And it is overwhelming and it's very hard for them uh, to do a prediction. And this is the situation that uh, Dr. Patu Gupta found himself at Mount Sinai. And he wanted to automate echocardiogram diagnosis. And the average doctor has about a hit rate that's a little bit better than chance. It's uh, lower than 60%. And so uh, we want to improve that. The challenge here is that uh, we have a lot of data that comes in in real time, uh, which we have to analyze. So we have 90 metrics. The heart has 90 metrics, so that means, uh, for instance, the, sorry, for instance, the volume, I was not touching my mic, for instance, the volume or the stress level or whatever it is, and we measure that at six locations, those mechanical values, and we measure it 20 times per beat. And that gives us then about 100K, 1,000 attributes. 
<coughs> and if we put this in the associative memory, we get some uh, million triples. But we are able to analyze in real time and to discern the difference. And you can see this here on this uh, slide. You see this pattern there on the paper where this uh, work was published. You see uh, red, a red pattern, and you see a green pattern that uh, the computer, the cognitive computing, has found. And so the doctors are able to discern those two conditions. And that is very important because they look very similar. And that's why there is such a low uh, rate of hitting it right from a doctor's point of view. But the machine is able uh, to discern it. And uh, Dr. Patus Gupta has gotten the prize of the Feigenbaum Association, the Feigenbaum Prize of the American Association of Echocardiograms for this work. So and if you use traditionally, those doctors use a C3. And those of you who are machine learning guys know what it is. And they have seven attributes, and they have 54%. And like I said, the average of a human being is something like, like in the 60s. And the best doctor, which is, which is Bato himself, he makes 76%. And with Saffron, he have achieved 90%. So um, now let me talk about this match made in heaven, uh, this love story between uh, the cognitive distance, which is a universal distance, uh, which we use uh, for reasoning, which we use for machine learning on top of a representation, uh, the associative memory. And we have achieved uh, three things here. First, we have achieved universality. Uh, cognitive distance is universal in the sense that it is a distance that is independent of the domain. It measures the distance between DNA. It measures the distance between two pieces of music, between uh, uh, different languages, between customers, between competitors, whatever you can think of. And at the same time, the associative memories are universal in the sense that they are non-parametric and they allow to learn incrementally. They allow to learn from samples and the weights are deterministic. So you make no neural networks. Well, they are the little brother of associative memories because you have to optimize for the weights. Whereas associative memories, and I'll talk about that a bit more in detail on a later slide, have uh, deterministic weights. And secondly, uh, we are able to handle context. Cognitive distance is can be conditioned on context. It is a distance that depends on the context. And then we talk in detail about that. Like if you think about Euclidean distance, and some people use this for machine learning, but definitely we use it in our Newtonian world if we want to measure distance. But this distance does not depend on the context. It does not depend on nearby objects. Whereas the distance in the information world, mm -hmm. in a high dimensional world, very high dimensional, in the Gates case, we use the million attributes, so we have a super high dimensional space, very sparse. In this world, in the information world, it is this which is very nonlinear, uh, we cannot use so naively a distance like the Euclidean distance. We have to use a distance that is context dependent. And at the same time, the associative memory allows us uh, to store the context. It builds a complete graph, and it is a triple store. And we claim we are the fastest triple store in the world. And then lastly, uh, we have achieved compression. Now, compression is what brings those two lovers, Romeo and Juliet, together. Because <coughs> Kolmogorov complexity is based on compression. It is a measure of how compressible an, an object is, a string is. And the associative memories are a perfect compressor. And now let me explain that uh, a bit more in detail. What is com Kolmogorov complexity? It's a way to discern the signal from the noise. Now let's look at this uh, snake eyes here. What is so special about the snake eyes? We all feel, well, this is not a random sequence. What is so special about it? Kolmogorov has formalized our intuition, and it actually goes back to Laplace, who has formulated this idea for the first time. He has shown that those regular objects, and this is a very regular string, they are of measure zero. They are very rare. And it, that means we do not find them by coincidence. If we see them, there is a reason, there is a cause behind. 
there is a signal behind. And by a, a regular string or by a regular object, we mean an object that can be described in a very short program. In a program that is shorter than the length of the string. So here we have the snake eyes and it's a, we have two lines of code and we can produce a million snake eyes, right? It's just print a million times the snake eyes. But if we have a, a random string, we have to print the string by having, uh, if we have a string that has a million bits, we have a million lines of code. So that is what Kolmogorov complexity is about in an intuitive way. It is about um, how long is the shortest program to reproduce, to print the string. And a, a number like pi, for instance, it is, a, it is a regular object in the sense of Kolmogorov. It's a small program, and they can print all the digits of pi. So follow me now to Las Vegas, where Alice has left the Wonderland, and she is throwing the dice at the crap table. To her surprise, she gets a hundred times the snake eyes. She fumes because she feels cheated. She is sure that the dice have been loaded. So much that she goes to court and says, this casino cheats. They have loaded dice because they got a hundred times the snake eyes. But the judge rules against her. He says, Alice, you cannot complain after the fact. There is a small probability, and it's bigger than zero, for getting the snake eyes. So this is not a proof that the dice have been loaded. But the judge studied in Silicon Valley, and he hung out with some friends, mathematicians and physicists, and so he knows what Kolmogorov complexity is all about. And he tells Alice to go back and to put a huge bet on all simple outcomes. Thus, she can hedge against the loaded dice. There are only, Kolmogorov has shown, they are of number of measure zero. There are only very few regular sequences. So she can afford it. She can put all her money and she can put it all on the regular sequences. And there are only very few ways to cheat after all, right? A dice has only six sides. Alice does that, goes back and wins big because the dice were loaded. So understand that an efficient gambler is also an efficient compressor. If a gambler plays a random sequence, we cannot compress the sequence like we have seen before. Random sequences cannot be compressed. We only can reproduce them bit by bit. But a gambler that wins plays better than a random sequence, and it can be compressed. So from a gambler, be from an efficient a game, from a good gambler being an efficient compressor to Google as a compressor. Imagine we take Google. Right? We take a web search, we take a web engine, and Google is the knowledge, it's a representation of the knowledge of mankind. Everybody has contributed, we have those web pages, and we assume we have all the knowledge of mankind there. And we would like now to use uh, the cognitive distance to extract similarity from Google. And we would actually like to know if the idea of the saddle is closer to the cowboy than the idea of the movie. For that purpose, we type in cowboy, and we note on how many documents we find cowboy. Google has an inverted index, and so we get a couple of million times uh, documents uh, with, uh, which have the word cowboy. <coughs> we do the same for the saddle and for the movie. And then we type in saddle and cowboy, and saddle and movie respectively, and we get the joint cowboy. And if you look at this, we could think, oh, uh, the cowboy is more related. If we think about a graph, there are many more connections between the cowboy and the movie. But if we calculate uh, the cognitive distance, in this case, we actually calculate an approximation. As it turns out, we cannot calculate Kolmogorov complexity because of the Turing halting problem. And we can talk about it later. But practically, that's not a problem. We just use an approximation, a very a good one. And then we find, indeed, the saddle is closer to the cowboy uh, than the movie. But things are not that easy because of ambiguity. So now we do the same thing and we type fan into Google. Google does not understand the difference between a mechanical fan and a Hollywood fan. 
So if we then calculate the cognitive distance in the naive way between the uh, movie fan and the CPU, we get exactly the same distance at be between the mechanical <coughs> fan and the movie star. So what we need is we need context. So if we then go back and look at those documents and we see if temperature appeared in the same sentence or in a similar sentence as the mechanical fan and CPU, then the CPU moves closer to the mechanical fan. If we find Hollywood in, this, in, a, in a similar sentence or in a close by sentence, the movie star <coughs> moves closer to the movie fan. So what we learn here is that cognition is all about context. Analyzing text, analyzing images, understanding random variables, it is all about context. And for context, we need triples. And this is why Google can't do semantic search, because they do not have triples. In the Google case, we would have to take these millions of documents that have the CPU and uh, the mechanical fan, and we would have to look if, if the temperature is close by. Well, that does not scale in real time. And the other important thing is this cognitive distance can be conditioned. The cognitive distance depends on the context. And that is something very deep. Have you ever used the distance that depends on context? But this is how the information world works. If we ask ourselves which city is closest to G Steve Jobs, the answer is, it depends on who is asking. Is it a neighbor? The right answer is Palo Alto. Is it a colleague who asks? The answer is Cupertino. If we ask from a European point of view for the closest city to Steve Jobs, the answer should be a more popular idea, a more popular city like San Francisco. So you see, in the information world, the distance depends on context. And this is a mathematically very deep uh, fact that we can condition a distance. You cannot condition a Euclidean distance. We cannot condition a inner product, a, a cosine, or whatever other distance you can think of, you cannot condition it. But you can condition the cognitive distance. And also importantly, I have mentioned it, we have to be able to store the context in the fabric. We have to have a representation that has context in order to be able to understand semantics and to do some deep machine learning that is cognitive computing. And this brings us to the bride of our love story, which is the associative memory. And uh, I apologize for this slide. I am a physicist, so it's a very busy slide. But an associative memory is no sequel. It is as fundamental a way to compute as the von Neumann architecture. It's on the same level with the von Neumann architecture. There are three ways to compute. The von Neumann architecture, cellular automata, and associative memory, and it was invented more or less at the same time by a physicist called Hopfield. It is isomorphic to the Ising model, which explains order-disorder uh, transitions. So this has something to do with emerging properties. It is <coughs> asynchronous. It does not have a synchronous clock speed like the von Neumann architecture. It's asynchronous, and it works it, uh, the points move, and you can see here it has fixed points, it has a Puno function, it's mathematically very well defined. The points move to a fixed point, to the closest fixed point uh, where you start, and that way you can do the recall. So all I, I ask you to take home and to remember is that the weights are deterministic. That's why we can use it for machine learning, where we can use it for this universality. We want to have a universal representation, a universal fabric, to go with our universal distance, with our universal information distance. And that is what an associative memory offers, as opposed to a lot of other methodologies that are very popular, like support vector machines or like neural networks. I'm sure all of you have heard of that. Uh, in this case, you have to optimize the weights. Here, we do not have to optimize the weights. All we have to, uh, to know is connections and counts, and that's why it's called a memory which works like a synapse. It actually, in our case, does not work in memory. It works on this, <coughs> it's still called an associative memory. And it has three qualities that are very special. It is content addressable. So the semantics determine the location. That's very nice for distribution, because we have no lookup. We have no centralized piece in, this, in the software. 
uh, it is distributed. <coughs> also, there is a very unique uh, capability in the uh, in the bit vector space, and that is that things. Uh, that uh, we only need certain characteristic bits or certain characteristic attributes in order to be able uh, to understand uh, what we are doing. And so let me explain that a little bit. So here you see, let's assume we have an n-dimensional space. We have about, uh, we, and we have this n-dimension is a thousand. So we have a thousand attributes and then um, we have a binomial distribution because we look at the distance distribution. So we put ourselves on a sphere and we are on the North Pole and the furthest distance away is the South Pole and most of the distances will be around the equator and those distances will have a mean value, an expectation value of n half, which is 500. They are 500 bits away. And um, and actually, this is a binomial distribution which becomes a Gaussian distribution in the limit. So if we look at the Euclidean distance, in the Euclidean space, we will have distances very close by. Whereas in this space, we look at six sigma, right? The Gaussian distribution, six sigma, there's not much going on there anymore. Um, the six sigma would be 425 uh, bits. So this is, the, this is the North Pole where we are. 425 bits and we would find only one out of a million attributes, one out of a million vectors, one out of a million objects there, right? That is very, very remarkable. So if we say we make a radius of 400 bits, we only need 0.6% probability for a recall. So out of these 1,000 attributes, we only need 200 to be able uh, to recall our vector ac accurately. And here you see the mathematics for that, 20%. Uh, uh, and, and then the rest can be random. So 80% can be, we do not know if we hit have a 1 or a 0, and we have 0 0.6 record. And that is a very remarkable fact. And that's why it works. That's why our brain also works. There would be no way to recall what we have seen or what we understand exactly. We only do have to do it very approximately. <coughs> and that is if the space is random, if the distribution of the distances is random. But we have a structure, we have meaning, we have a signal, so it's not random. That works also for us. And the, the other element is that is the know-how of Saffron Technologies. So far, this is associative memories and that an old thing. But the know-how of Saffron Technologies is to have a fast decoder so that we can decode in real time. And so what we do is we build an, a three-dimensional graph and uh, we transform it into 2D, into a matrix. And that is mathematically exact because uh, matrices are isomorph to graphs. And there's actually a famous book that came out by the Lincoln Lab where they show that and show a, a lot of interesting algorithms on top of it. And then we have to linearize the matrix. Those matrices are super sparse and we kind of have to make them linear. So the record in an associative memory, it's not an activation like in a normal memory and we have an address and we start on the left and then we record it. It is actually building the space. And like I said, we only need a certain accuracy and we can rebuild it and be able to record vectors. So now I have uh, two or three slides on, on more of the details how what we have done. So what we basically do is uh, we build a graph in real time. We build it out of the box. We unify structured and unstructured data, as you have seen in the case of Boeing, for instance. We take key performance indicators for braking uh, for certain parts, and we take the soft information, what the pilot says, the notes from the mechanic, and we combine that, and this is out of the box. No problem here, you have, a, you have an out of the box ETL. Then also we do NLP, natural language processing. In the case you have text, you have to understand the sentences, what is an entity, what is a person, a location, and all of that. And then uh, we build a graph. And on the edges of the graph are the entities, and on the uh, sorry, on the vertex of the graph are the entities and the edges, they connect the vertices and there we have how often have we seen this, how often have we had this co-occurrence. 
So this is, <coughs> we build the brain, we build the connections, and then we make the brain think. Then we use uh, cognitive distance. On top of it, Kolmogorov complexity uh, for the reasoning. And uh, this is very nice because it's parameter free. It learns incrementally, sort of called lazy learning. Um, it is a combination of semantics and statistics, and this is my definition of, of cognitive computing. You find that also in Watson and other people who try to do cognitive computing. It has a combination of semantics and statistics, and that is very, very new. You know, AI so far was only semantics. Those guys threw out, actually, the friend of Kolmogorov, Sholomonov, he was the American counterpart of the Russian guy, and he, they both found it more or less at the same time. So the whole thing is also called Kolmogorov, Sholomonov, and Chetin. Chetin was a guy from the Bronx. Uh, with 18, he just finished high school. He came also to the same idea, and he found a function that's called the omega function. It's the oracle. If we have this function, we can answer any problem, any question in mathematics. And he has defined how this function is to look like. So anyway, there was a fight in the 80s between the people who did semantics and statistics, and then Sholomonov walked out 1984 out of AAAI, the Association of the Advance, the American Association of the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. And that was a, I think it was a sad thing, but now we are bringing it together, we're coming here together. So one big, one important element is the combination of semantics and statistics, the semantics being the graph and the statistics in an easy way, think of it, of being the connections. And then we can store those billions of triples and we can record them in real time. So the happy ending of our beautiful marriage and love story is uh, that uh, we can do discovery and search. <coughs> the offspring of Kolmogorov complexity and associative memories is a search, a smart search. And I have shown you that. I have shown you how we can do semantic search in context, how we can go beyond what Google does, for instance, what Google offers us. We can do this also over time. Things evolve over time. Ideas evolve over time. And also to random variables. So uh, this is called convergence. We can do classifications. It's an example of supervised machine learning. For instance, predicting who is bad and good, who has a good or a bad credit risk. Um, we can calculate the customer lifetime value, the influencer lifetime value. Uh, we can do echocardiodiagram diagnosis where we, where we have classified uh, the echocardiodiagram with huge amount of data that come out of the machine in the control group, which is the healthy people, and then in the two conditions. Um, and then we can use it for unsupervised machine learning, for instance, for clustering, for the evolutionary tree. Kolmogorov complexity, the cognitive distance is the only machine learning methodology that can find the evolutionary tree the right way, for instance, that finds that we come from the Rex. That was a long discussion between biologists and, um, and, in, and actually the first mammals were rats. So we all come from the rats. And if you use uh, uh, cognitive distance, if you use the normalized information distance, you will see that. If you do traditional partial matching or all the traditional methodologies on DNA, you would not find that. Uh, you can use it for languages, I've talked about it for music, you can find how two mu pieces of music are similar, you can use it for novelty detection, spare parts, and so on. So, my takeaway for you here is that um, uh, we have uh, developed cognitive computing, or we have advanced cognitive computing to the next level that it can perform uh, like super brains. And how have we done this? By combining a representation that is as fundamental as the von Neumann architecture that allows us to, to query data in real time, to, to store billions of triple and query them in real time. And on top of it, we, u we use uh, a, a universal distance measure to be able to reason by similarity. And this whole approach is parameter free and I'm deeply convinced, and we can discuss this very hotly, if we want to have machines that are really, that will automate cognition, as much as pocket calculators have automated arithmetics, and I grew up in a time when there were no pocket calculators, so we used 
logarithmic tables and whatever, so it's about 500,000 times than faster than a human being. If we want to have uh, cognitive computing machines that can do cognition faster than we do, it has to be parameter free. And in, this, in our case, it is also instantly and incremental. And then we have to be able to discern context. We have to be able to have this triple. And do not forget, this thing is enterprise ready. You have seen Google has just bought a company that do also deep learning, um, but they are only in a research state. We have been out there for a while, and we have some applications that are real. And at this point, I thank you very much for your attention. And Yeah, so go ahead, and here is a video, and if we have time and leisure, I'll, I'll show you this video, what, what Pato is saying about it, because it's very nice. Go ahead. Maybe you want to have a microphone to talk. Thank you, that was very interesting. Um, two of your examples of what you are, are accomplishing already um, come from industries that seem to be very regulated, so there's going to be a lot of documentation. That was one was uh, aerospace, the other one was healthcare. So while I would expect uh, anything to kind of degrade as the amount of information available is less, it seems like your approach intuitively may degrade lesser, uh, more gracefully as there's less information. So with that in mind, do you perceive the ability to at some point indicate, oh, we need more information here to be more sure of a, of, of, uh, uh, a decision. I, so I'm kind of flipping it around and saying, is it, is it able to actually guide us into where it might need more information to, uh, to the cognition? So in healthcare, you think about uh, Watson, and this argument applies for Watson. Watson has to have huge amounts of data and ontologies in order to be able to work and start. But in the example I have shown you here, and you can look at the video, the only thing is there is no text. It is only a signal that comes from the mechanical properties of the heart. I do not use any text, and I use only 15 patients to train the system. So, yeah, actually, I love very sparse data. That's what this is all about. Associative memories are a way of sparse coding. It is sparse matrices. That's, uh, if, you, if you look at it from a mathematical point of view. And when I look out in the world, I say, uh, most people say there's an information overflow. We have too much information. And if you look at me, you're right. They had all this information, and they were not able to use it. And we have all this social data out there. And on the other hand, the companies have transactional data. They have their customer data. And wouldn't it be nice when we talk to them, to United, to, or to Verizon, or to those guys? They understand our context. They understand what we have and what we do when we talk to them in the call center. Yeah, so we want to have as much information as possible. Sometimes we don't have it all. But this approach is works also with less data, but the cool part is it scales for a huge amount of data for what we call big data. And it's not even so much when we talk about big data, it's not only the amount of the data that, that it is a lot, it is also the variety and the velocity that the data changes. So when we work with sensors, for instance, on the shop floor or on planes, the data changes all the time, or if you think about financial data, this is a, you get billions of data just one month. If you look at a couple of sensors, you have billions of data. So I, I see our problem on the other way around. The data is growing, and as you know, the data grows exponentially. It grows like Moore's law, right? It doubles every 18 months. So we actually have more data, and most of the time, we are not able to use it. But yeah, it also works if it is a small amount of data, but then I did that already in the 80s. So the special thing is now, you don't have to wait for overnight. You can do it in real time. Another quick, quick question before I pass on the mic. Uh, it seems like that um, there's hardware acceleration going on somewhere underneath the hood, maybe in the, um, the uh, memory aspect of it. The, uh, is that true? Yeah, not in our case. It's just called a memory because of this name dropping in the sense of it works like a neuron, and that's like our memories work. So we do you we use at the moment kind of very ordinary hardware. But you're right, the future will be, if you ask me what will be the future of computing, I will not be phenomenal architecture. It produces so much entropy. 
in such an inefficient way. I, I'm a physicist when I used the first time computers, which was 75. I was shocked that anybody had the idea that there's a global clock speed. There's no global clock speed in physics or chemistry or biology. Processes are asynchronous, right? And we had this big thing in the 90s where we were talking about distributed agents and intelligent agents. And my prediction is the guy who will win this race will be who will be able to do a distributed theory, for instance. And not a theory that has to go back to a server and to do all the calculation on the server and then comes out. You have seen Intel has announced now something that you plug in your ear and the series in the ear. And then my theory will talk to yours and to those guys, and we will talk to each other. We will have distributed <coughs> computing. That is how swarms work. That is how evolution has worked. And I see no reason why computers shouldn't work that way. And the model for that is associative memories. Yep. Um, do you perform the cognitive distance in the real space or complex space? So yeah, that's a good question. The tricky part is, um, what is so special about what I have been talking about? We do not use uh, the Euclidean distance in the original space, for instance, because that is an ill post problem. I have only 15 patients, and I have a 10, I have the, my, my space has 10,000 dimensions, talking about the echocardiodiagrams at Mount Sinai, right? So I have only 15 patients, this is super sparse. Most of my uh, probability distribution function that I try to model will be have holes, it's like a Swiss cheese, right? So if you try to go and to, to model the probability distribution function, you are lost. So that's why most people have used so far only second order statistics, you assume Gaussian and then you do a mean value and the standard deviation. <coughs> but you want to go beyond that. So what I do then is, I use a scalar that describes the probability distribution function. And the first guy who did this was actually Boltzmann and then Shannon. Uh, Boltzmann was the first, and then Shannon did it in computer science. But Shannon had only a concept for what he then called entropy for information content for ensembles. He was not concerned with, the do with single objects. So he had the problem, I have, um, I have eight documents or eight uh, notes that I want to send, how many bits do I need, and um, that they can be transmitted without a loss. And then he came up uh, with the entropy, the Shannon entropy, and we know it is three bits. But he wasn't concerned about the content. And Kolmogorov has extended this concept uh, to, to single object. So you have a single, you have a Kolmogorov complexity for the number pi for any object that you can think of, for any idea, and I have shown you this, we have calculated the Kolmogorov complexity when we calculated the, the distance between the cowboy and the saddle, we calculated the Kolmogorov complexity of the saddle, of the cowboy and the movie. Based so on the entropy of the input signal? No, no, based actually, yeah, on a, based on a, on a Shannon final code in that case. But the, 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 the universal distance, it does not matter if you use a statistical concept or if you use a, you use a semantics or you use a partial matching. So think of it, this is, a, this is a very deep point, but think of it like a piece of music. How would you do similarity, the distance between pieces of music? You can use the author who has written the music, right? And you would say, yeah, a Beethoven is closer to another Beethoven than to a Mozart. You can use the genre and you would say, yeah, chess and classical music. And then you could use the beats per second and whatever you can come up with Cognitive distance has its all in its belly. It, that's why it's universal. This is why it's such a deep <coughs> concept. It has all this there. So it is, it can be, you can think of it, and sometimes, like I said, you have to approximate it. And in this case of the Google, we use the statistical approximation, we use the Shannon Fano code, and we said that uh, words that are more often, that are more probable, will have a smaller code, and they have a smaller Kolmogorov complexity. But we could have done partial matching, or we could have done some types of semantics, or whatever it is, and it's still in the same framework. So that's the cool part. We we leave we leave we go out of this uh, of this PDF of the probability distribution function. We have a scalar to compare it, and if you think about it, there's something called the Renyi entropy. Renyi later uh, took uh, Kolmogorov 
and he generalized the entropy into Rennie entropy, and then it is actually a function, a complex function, uh, that we can use to have a divergence. But it that was a very long answer to a short question, but. No, I understand, but even in the, in the Shannon's case, the log of a negative number will take you to the complex space, so you'll be also doing that in complex space. No, the log, the log of a real number does of not take. Of a negative number. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 yeah, you can, okay. Yeah. Anyway, any other question? Yes, a question about, um, when you mention similarity um, and distance, right? Sometimes the similarity and difference, distance can be associated with a verb. <coughs> Let's say saddle and cowboy. So the cowboy uses uh, you know, a saddle to yeah. ride. So I'm wondering if any of this, uh, let's say, connection or connectivity, how, how do you actually, or can it be associated with also other semantics? Sure, 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 that is a nice example. I mean, I don't know. If Depends on your background. If you are an NLP guy, you say, oh yeah, a triple, that is an RDF triple, right? Right. But what we use, the triples are more generic. I also can use an XOR function, right? Where I have two random variables that are not correl correlated at all, they are independent. I send out zeros and ones. And then I have Paul coming in and he rings a bell if he sees a one on the left side and a zero on the right side. And I listen to his bell and I see a zero and they know there has to be a one on the left side. So two random variables that have been uncorrelated become correlated by a third one, right? This takes all problem. <coughs> it's a nonlinear problem. It's the simplest example of a nonlinear problem. This is all one. And if you if you are an NLP guy, you think the right way. My triple would be the cowboy they settle and maybe writes or uses. And that is the context, right? So then I have the context of using it, but I made it a simple, simple example with the temperature and this, this ambiguity. But the context is exactly the triple. And if you use only pairwise correlation, and the other guys out there who do this, Planck, pretty famous, and uh, high stock value nowadays, I wonder how, how high it will still go, uh, they can only do pairwise correlation. And this is very noisy, right? You ask yourself about. Um, uh, you, you, because you are missing the context. The, the other question is, you mentioned that you one of the secret sauces is how you handle the matrix. And, uh, I'm how we linearize the matrix, yeah. Yeah, linearize the matrix. So I'm wondering if, if you know, something related to latent semantics, uh, semantic uh, you know, analysis or a single value de decomposition of how you map from 3D to 2D, or is this something that you, you're using to uh, basically um, do the, the uh, no, no, okay. no. That's a good question. If you do, you can map a matrix uh, into a diagonal. Right. And you can do it with a singular value decomposition or an eigenvalue decomposition. What's the problem here? It works only in a linear space. It only works in a Euclidean space. It works not for nonlinearity. <coughs> Uh -huh. Can so, so this this mapping is a naive mapping, and some people use it, like Rubinoso, for instance. And it's nice; you can, it's you can use it for generalization. But, but, but I use a a a much more generic concept. So you're not using something like uh, like in the case of uh, uh, a function that then moves it into the linear space, like when you do uh, support vector machines. That's what they typically use. You have a kind of a function that then puts it in linear space, and then you can apply the lin linear algorithms to it. Yeah, I use, I use the bigger product of that. So what is a support vector machine? This is a kernel approach. Yeah. And, um, and it is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, yeah. right? But what's the problem with the support vector machine is you do a nonlinear mapping, you, you have to find your function phi, or whatever it's called. And this is very arbitrary. Your support vectors are arbitrary. Whereas I use the bigger product, as I call it, and this is something, it's called a pass and windowing, for instance. So you can also use the reproducing kernel Hilbert space in another way, and your dot product, your metric, is a cross entropy, right? And that has to do with Kolmogorov with the generalization of the entropy. And then you can use, for instance, Rainy entropy with the alpha being equal to and then you can have something like an information potential, and then you can calculate it, and you can show that you can estimate exactly the Rennie entropy from pairwise interactions. And that is 
in, 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 in some way at a high level how you linearize or how you do this because you do not linearize it really and we have to be careful about this term. What we actually do is we do a dimensionality reduction. Thank you. You're welcome. But they are two, they are related by the way. This, if you want, send me an email, I'll show you a paper that shows how those two kernels are related. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, have you compared with what you're, what you're doing with a running locality, se locality sensitive hashing on commodity hardware? That is getting rid of the associative memory, just just relying on algorithms and not fancy physics and stuff like that. Well, I do not rely on fancy physics. I mean, <laughs> and in some sense, in some sense, uh, so what all this is all about is. I, 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 have you compared it with locality sensitive hashing? Which I, is I, I do locality sensitive sensitive hashing. I do not, an associative memory, if you do, if you do content addressable, you also do locality sensitive fashion. Right, it's, 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 a, it's a physical way to do locality sensitive hashing, but people are doing it on commodity hardware very efficiently all yeah, the I, time I, I now. Yeah, I do the same, I use it also on commodity hardware. I, I use it also on commodity hardware. I'd kind of relate, a related question, that's why I was going to the mic next. Like, when people have been talking about deep learning, they've shown a lot of the benchmarks, right? There's a lot of standard data sets that people have been working with for many years. So have you guys compared yourself with some of the standard benchmarks in, in different fields, as yeah. opposed to case studies? Yeah, we have done, we have done uh, DNA analysis uh, with the MIT data set, RNA, cancer. Um, and then in this example here, that was a competition, as I showed you, C3 or whatever, whatever kind of tree algorithms you want to use or are. I mean, um, I would not say that there is, in R you can do basically everything your mind can think of, but it just does not scale. So there are two dimensions to that. The, the, the dimension one is the scalability, and then show me somebody who can read an email in real time and can do uh, classification with a million attributes. Go ahead. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they buy everything there is. They would have bought somebody else if it were out there. They did, we did a lot of tests. And, um, and then this, this, uh, the, the Mount Sinai data set is also public. And like I said, we have compared it to others. I do not go out and compete on Kaggle or so because I do not believe so much in that. That's not real data. That's sanitized data, right? And so, um, the, so the thing is, if you think Kaggle is an interesting thing, you go to Kaggle and then people find it very fast. Uh, it, it converges to something, and then it goes very, very slowly, and you cannot squeeze out more. But the question is, well, what is it that you, that you want to do? I have a tool that is, that is parameter free. You do not need a data scientist. You do not need ontologies. You can use ontologies, but you don't need it. I do it out of the box. I unify your data, and I do machine learning with a precision and scalability that I don't see anywhere else. That's it. So I didn't, you can go ahead. If you give me a student, let's do that. I mean, I mean, but we will publish the, the part of the, the, the Mount Sinai data from Patus and Gupta. This data will be published, and it will have some other comparisons. Yeah, that's basically what we're looking for. And the other one was publications that are reproducible. Yeah, yeah, that are reproducible. Yeah, no, I, I know, and you know the <coughs> it is a little bit the DNA of the company. Yeah, totally. There's even an internal discussion, but I'm on your side. We come from the the DOD and the three letter agencies, and they keep everything very tightly. But on the other hand, if you want to have comparability, what we will be doing that right now. Mm -hmm. When did you start? Sanford. The company started uh, 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. How does someone gain access to your technology? Can they, do you license it? Do you have an SDK? Do you have an API? Yeah, we have an How API. We so here at the bottom, you take in structured and unstructured data. You take in uh, streaming, and, and streaming can be a Twitter, if you come from an NLP point of view, or it can be time series if you are more a physicist or electrical engineer. And then, um, if it's text, you have to do the NLP. Then we build the graph. 
and then we have uh, we store it and then we have this engine on top of it um, and then we have an API uh, that you can use or we have also a very simple tool uh, for doing uh, discovery and, and simple ways of supervised machine learning. So there's an API at the bottom and one on the top. If you look here, uh, this is a bit, if you look at it from an ecosystem point of view, um, you have the uh, three steps where you, where you take the data, where you harvest it, um, then you do, for instance, the NLP part, you do the pre-processing, then you have the analytics engine, and then you show it in Tableau or, or whatever UI you want. You can take the data out. Some of our customers put it in Hadoop. So we have a license that is on demand or on-premise. Does that answer the question? Yeah. We, we also fit in the Hadoop ecosystem, so that looks a bit like here. 